sitting down and opening up. Is there a cover-up when it comes to cover Oregon? Look, Laurel, no one is more angry about this than I am. Oregon Governor John Kitzhaber joins us for an exclusive interview, his longest on camera since the failed launch of the Cover Oregon website. To have such a colossal flop seems unbelievable to a lot of people. What he knew when, and what he plans to do next about the health care exchange, plus the Columbia River crossing, and the trend toward legalizing marijuana. From News Channel 8, this is Straight Talk with Laurel Porter. On the subject of whether you deserve a fourth term, uh, your critics are dogging you about Cover Oregon, the state's health insurance exchange, and Republican Representative Dennis Richardson, ha who's running against you for governor, has said that there is a cover-up that goes to the very highest levels of state government. Is there a cover-up when it comes to Cover Oregon? Look, Laurel, no one is more angry about this than I am, and no one wants to get to the bottom of it more than I do. Uh, we've changed out leadership over at Cover Oregon. Uh, we've retained FIRST Data, which is doing an independent external review to determine exactly what happened uh, and why. And I'll be happy to sit down here with you and that, when that report is back, and, and we'll take whatever uh, steps are, are necessary. There's the question being asked a lot, though, is what you knew and when. When, when did you know that Cover Oregon was having some problems? Well, I knew in late October that it was not going to roll out and be functional. Um, as you know, any large IT project like this is going to have some questions and concerns, in this case dating back almost a year before the project was rolled out. Uh, from the information that received my, in my office, uh, we were assured that each one of those issues had been uh, investigated and had been resolved. Some people question how you couldn't have known until late October. I had um, somebody from Cover Oregon on Straight Talk 10 days before the October 1st rollout, and she was already indicating that people wouldn't be able to go onto the website for the first few weeks as they worked out bugs. And then the company Maximus, which is the quality assurance company hired by the state, had written numerous reports raising red flags, saying that Oracle's performance was unacceptable at best, that staff was quitting at an alarming rate, that there was no way that that October 1st deadline was ever going to be met. Did you read that report? How could you not have known yes, that? Yes, I was aware of, uh, of the concerns that Maximus raised. And as I said before, we were, we were told that the, those specific concerns had been investigated, had been reviewed, and had been addressed. And um, I, I, was, I was... And you uh, believed it? I did believe it. I had no reason not to believe it. And uh, obviously, we were not getting good information. There are allegations now that the federal government, which has given Oregon $300 million for this project, might have been misled, that the state was supposed to show progress. There may be staff members who created dummy sites to show that Cover Oregon was making more progress than it was. Do you think the federal government was misled? Again, I'm not going to prejudge uh, what, what happened until I have an external review that gives me some objective information about the entire rollout. The purpose, the objective of the Affordable Care Act, the purpose of the health insurance exchange is to enroll people in health care. And it is happening. It's not elegant, but as I said, Just not online. Nobody's been able to enroll online. Well, parts of the website are, are that's, that's correct. But now she wants to trade the operating room for the halls of the U.S. Capitol. I'm going to the U.S. Senate to try to change things, to make things better. Observers say that for you to win this race, a lot of things are going to have to break your way. Mm -hmm. And your campaign got off to a little bit of a rocky start right before the primary when these police reports were revealed involving three different incidents with two men in your lives, um, your former husband and a former boyfriend, where they ended up calling the police complaining about your behavior. How much damage do you think those police reports did to your campaign? I will tell you that this was uh, just a effort by the Merkley campaign to distract from his poor record on jobs, the economy, health care, education. Dr. I Ruby, think they really this... happened though. Those incidents really happened in your past. And there are some voters who are concerned that it might be a reflection on your character, your judgment, and your temperament, how two different men in two different relationships over a period of years ended up calling the police, felt it necessary to call the police on you because of what they called your behavior and and your ex-boyfriend said stalking. I am not going to drag my family and people I love into, but isn't this into a, the policy. This is a and U.S. Senate politics. race, though. Isn't everything on the table? Shouldn't people be able to look at your background, your character, and decide who they're voting on, the total picture? 
I am not going to, uh, I'm going to protect my children and people that I love. I'm not going to drag them into this. There's been a history in Oregon and other states, though, of certain candidates who've gone on to be elected, who've had character flaws, they've had judgment issues. Shouldn't people know a lot about you, know more about you and your background? I think the fact that I'm a, a very accomplished pediatric neurosurgeon, that I um, have been president of multiple organizations, I've been on multiple boards, I think uh, if think there were enough? a character flaw that it would be uh, apparent. You think that's all voters need to know? I'm not going to say any more on this issue, Laurel. I think that this is uh, um, uh, an attempt to distract from the issues. We have about a minute left, but I want to ask you about an issue that's important to sure. a lot of people in Oregon. That's gay marriage. Yeah. And a lot of Republicans have come out in favor of gay marriage. Yeah. Where do you stand as a well, young Republican? You know, I think um, certainly younger folks have a, a slightly different take um, on uh, gay uh, and lesbian issues and as uh, and those issues. Um, however, I think I think this is an issue that's going to, you know, it's not a federal issue. It's not an issue that the um, Congress is going to deal with. It's an issue that looks like it's going to be dealt with with by the courts here. Do you support and, it? Um, I I think it's, you know, oh, I've got 15 seconds. Yes I or no? I think I think it's going to be dealt with uh, by the courts, and that's going to be so that. You don't want to take a position. That it's just going to, you know, it's it's going to happen. It's going to happen. You are talking about two different things, and I understand why, Dave, because you'll do just about anything to not talk about your initiative. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about a uh, measure. Well, uh, I would like to ask you some more. Let's move on from the health and safety because there are a lot of other things that mm -hmm. your campaign brings up, and I've gotten four flyers at my house for, from the No campaign, all different ones, but they all talk about the cost. Trips to the grocery store would cost you more. How much more, according to your campaign? Studies that have been done in other states who have looked at these single state labeling policies estimated to be about $400 per year per family. And then all the way to that food processor, there has to be completely separate systems to comply with Measure 92, including the distribution that warehouse. That, that it's not just the labeling, which I think your site says it would cost $2.30 a family per year. Just what about the, the, label? the manufacturing, the warehousing, the segregating of the GMO and non-GMO products? Yeah. So um, I was recently talking with Ivan Molesky. So why do both sides, and a lot of this money is coming from out of state, nearly 100% from your side, I think there's one contributor from in-state, and about 80% of the money from your side is coming from out of state, although there are about 2,500 individual contributors. Most of the money is coming from out of state. Why do both sides care so much about what happens in Oregon? I'll start with Dana. You know, the people who are contributing to our campaign have a vested interest in this. Let's head over to Laurel Porter, who has some great analysis. We have a really exciting panel with us. We have Sheila Hamilton from Kink Radio representing the left and representing the right. Rob Kramer from KXL Radio. Thanks for joining us on the panel. Thank you. Len Pleasure. Bergstein, our KGW analyst, is here with us too. You've seen him earlier. And chime in, Len, if you want to jump into some of this conversation. But tying back the marijuana initiative that just passed really overwhelmingly, Measure 91, to the governor's race. USA Today and NBC News reporting that the Republicans have taken control, majority control of the Senate, now controlling both chambers, the House and Senate, for the first time in eight years. Let's ask our panel what that means for the next couple of years for President Obama, what it means for the Republicans. Rob Kramer. Well, first of all, it means Ron Wyden does lose his gavel as chair of the Senate Finance Committee. And probably next time runs for statewide office. Let's talk about some of the big money that we have seen in this campaign. No, something that's bothered you, Sheila, but we've seen $28.5 million in the Measure 92 campaign when you combine the money together, and most of it coming from out of state. Tom Steyer, who's a hedge fund billionaire out of California who is wanted to support candidates who want to fight climate change, he put a lot of money into this race to defeat two Republican candidates, uh, Bruce Starr, and he's in a neck-and-neck -neck race, isn't he, That's in, right. in his Senate race right now in Hillsboro. We've seen big money, of course, on the national level. I've read that there are a million ads that ran in the Senate races across the country at a half a billion dollars. I mean, where does it end? What do you think that's doing to this country? Well, it's uh, unifying the country, believe it or not, because can't believe that you could be among the 10% of people who think that a lot of money in campaign spending is okay. I can't believe that you would be somebody who doesn't care about the First Amendment. I don't believe your right that, to free I, speech. I don't believe corporations, corporations are people. Corporations have a right to yeah. free speech. I don't believe oh, corporations are people. Yeah. 
Ben and Jerry or Ben and Jerry, their company is different than Ben and Jerry. And so a corporation know. doesn't have the right to illegal search and seizure or the other rights that have come to people. So the, uh, the government could come in and search their records, right. search anything, and You'd take their property. You'd be a vast minority of people who aren't concerned about the billions of, of shadow money, dark money that that is now buying our elections and buying our policy. I love it our be the crossfire first time I was going in the minority on. Minority around here. <laughs> Len, I know you've been looking at some of this money that's been pouring into some of these campaigns. Can you want to and jump hoping in? that some of it would come my way? I mean, really. <laughs> I think that's been one of the best debates on this subject I've heard in a long time. I thought Sheila and Rob really kind of hit it right on the on the mark.